Many patients have asked questions about their MRIs and what is the process of reading that imaging. Um, you know, you've gotten your reports over, successive reports over time, and what does this mean when they say something's unremarkable or when they're following target lesions? Um, have, have the lesions grown or not? Um, all of a sudden you may say it goes from target lesions to multiple numerous lesions or, un, you know, so um, based on those questions, we asked Dr. Jimmy Wong to be with us today and present on that topic, understanding your MRIs. And Dr. Wong is Assistant Clinical Professor of Diagnostic Radiology and Radiologist at City of Hope. Please welcome him. Now, it used to be patients would get their imaging studies at an imaging center, and then the radiologist would interpret the exam, and the report would get sent to the, the patient's doctor, and then the patient's doctor would relay the results to the patient, and the patient never sees the report, or and far less commonly, they would see the actual images. But that's increasingly, with technology, patients have access to the reports, and in many cases, their images as well. And that's led to a lot of interest, both in the popular press and the scientific community, about how to deal with this trend. And so that's why I was asked to, as, as you heard earlier, to discuss with you how I approach an MRI exam or radiology exam in general, and in the process, help to answer some of the questions that you might have. So first, I'll start some terminology. I'm going to be showing some images. And also, you'll come across these terms when you're looking at your reports. Uh, there's several, there are many ways to image the patient in many different planes. In MRI, there's an infinite number of planes you can image. But the standard planes are the transversal axial plane, which is where you cut the patient in cross-section. So that's a head with the eyeballs in the front and the back of the head in the back. It's a sagittal plane where you cut the patient um, down the middle, so in that case, that's a spine right down the midline. And in the coronal plane, where it's as if you're looking at the patient, and you're looking at the patient from the front. So one thing that might be confusing is when you're reading a report and comparing to the images, right is left and left is right. So the right side of the patient is on the left side of the screen and on the left side of the image, and vice versa. And same for if you're looking at in a coronal plane, pretend you're looking at the patient from the front. So right is on your left and left is on your right. But once you're used to that, then it, it makes sense. And other terms you might hear, cranial caudal, top or bottom, or superior and inferior. So now that we got the terminology out of the way, I'm going to go over how I approach an oncologic imaging study. So my, the first questions I ask is, are there any tumors? because there's not always a tumor in the imaging study that I'm looking at. For example, if I have a tumor in the head, I'm looking at an imaging study of the liver, there may not actually be any tumors. And that's important because to say there are tumors when there aren't any can be just as bad as saying there are no tumors when there are actually tumors. So the first thing I ask is, do I find a tumor? And the next question I ask is, where are the tumors? And that's important to your doctor to get an idea of how widespread the disease is and also um, what they, if it's in a sensitive place, the tumor might need to be treated earlier than later. So in this case, there's a tumor in the bone, in the liver, and in the lungs. So the next question I ask is, how many tumors are there? And often, or sometimes there's just one, and then I say there's one, and sometimes there are many, or few, and I say there are few, and if the number is small enough, I usually try to make give an exact number, three, four, five, et cetera. But sometimes you just get so many that that's when we get things like innumerable, numerous, and there's no actual number of how many tumors there are. And next question I ask is how large are the tumors? Now to answer the question, there are a couple of other questions that have to be answered. One is which tumors to measure, and second, how to measure them. So first question, which tumors to measure? So if there's just one tumor, then he answer is simple, I'm going to measure that one. But what if there are many tumors? Then I choose a tumor based on how easy it is to measure, and not just on this exam, but how easy I expect it will be to measure in the future. So in this case, I'll probably pick that one because it's, it's sharply defined, it's 
there's normal liver around it. And so I think I can measure that one accurately and I can measure that one in the future as well. If I had to choose a second one, I'll probably choose that one for the same reasons. Now sometimes the patient will have a tumor, let's say in the colon or the pancreas, but that lesion isn't measured. For instance, this is a colon cancer and there's a tumor circle there they're in the colon, but that tumor is hard to measure. So I might rather choose not to measure that tumor and just say there is a tumor in the colon and instead choose to measure something that is not the primary tumor but a metastasis, in this case a lymph node in the right pelvis that I think I can measure reliably next time. And then a, one thing, something that patients are often confused by, frustrated, is why don't radiologists consistently measure the same tumors? And a very common reason why we don't is because we simply don't know what was measured before. So for example, if the, the report for the last exam said a mass in the liver measured 17 millimeters, well, look at the liver, every one of those dots is a tumor that I can't reliably say which one was measured before. Or the radiologist before tries to be helpful and say a mass in the liver measures 17 millimeter on a particular image, in this case, series four, image 14, and that's sometimes helpful, but let's say I go to that image and I find four or five tumors that measure about 17 millimeters. Then again, I don't know what was measured before. A lot of times these, these calipers are saved on the exam, so I can, I know what was, I can tell from those images what was measured before. But in a lot of software, these calipers can be changed or deleted, um, so they might not be available to me. And other reasons that tumors that were previously measured are not measured again, would be they should not have been measured in the first place. So for instance, um, something that was thought to be tumor on your first exam turns out not to be tumor. Well, it makes no sense to keep measuring that same normal thing over and over again just for the sake of consistency. So I might not talk about that, that structure again. Or if they can't be measured reliably anymore, for example, if a tumor grew, and it's now merged into something else, I can't measure it anymore. Well, rather than give an inaccurate measurement, I just, I might just not measure that tumor again. Or if they, the tumors that were measured before just don't support what I feel is the ultimate conclusion of this exam. For instance, if you have 10 tumors, one of them, the one that was measured before is smaller, but the other nine are larger, it makes much more sense to talk about the nine that are bigger than the one that is unchanged or smaller, because that just, weakens what I'm trying to convey to your doctor. So after deciding which tumors to measure, I'll ask how to measure these tumors. There are many ways to measure a tumor. It's, if it's more or less round, it's fairly straightforward. But even if in that case, there are many ways to measure. You can measure in the longest dimension. You can measure in one dimension or two dimensions. You can measure in some other axis. Or you can just measure in some strange ways, which sometimes we see. It's, and that make no particular sense. And to add more confusion to that, you can image in different planes. So you can measure, in, in addition to the two dimensions, you can measure the third dimension. And in that same, same plane, you can measure a tumor in many different ways. So in practice, it really doesn't, what, how is measured is not as important as it's being measured the same way time after time. Because if a tumor is bigger or smaller, it'll tend to go bigger or smaller in every dimension. Um, but it's the important thing is consistency and being able to measure that again in the future. So the next question to ask is, on which image should the tumor be measured? And that's not always a straightforward question because if you look at a typical MRI of the abdomen and pelvis, it has about 1,000 pictures. And it's, there are about 20 what we call sequences, which is different ways of imaging the same part of the body. So for a given tumor, in the liver, I might see it in 20 different ways. And so which one am I gonna, which one image am I gonna make, make that measurement on? So here's an example. So I think most people would say that there are more tumors on the right than on the left. But in fact, they're from the same exam. And they're just different parts of the same exam looking at different qualities of this tumor. And to highlight that further, I'm gonna pick one tumor and show that tumor in six different ways that this tumor's image on this one exam, they look a little bit different on every single one of them, and there are 20 or so of these. So how, on exactly which image it's, something is measured is gonna affect its size. And then, again, the way I choose it is, choose which image to measure is 
something where is the tumor well visualized and seen in a way that I think I can reproduce it the next time. So in this case, I'll probably pick that one because it's sharply circumscribed, there's nothing around it. And it might be a little different than if I measured it there, but as long as I measure it here every single time, I'll still get the general trend of is it getting bigger or smaller, and that's really the important thing. And then a common f complaint we get is why can't radiologists be consistent? And so what a lot of patients do is they, they get several, they have multiple exams, they take the reports, they put them side by side, and try to match up individual lesions with the size of the lesion and try to get a sense of what's going on. But sometimes it just doesn't make sense. You can measure different things, the measures don't make sense. I'm gonna give you an idea of why that can happen sometimes. So let's say there are three consecutive exams, and for simplicity, we'll say they're done using the same technique at the same place and interpreted by the same radiologist who knows what was measured and will always measure in the same way. So first exam, there's a tumor there in the liver, and the report says there's a mass in the liver that measures eight millimeter. You come back the second time, and the lesion, the tumor looks a little bit bigger now, so it measures 12 millimeter. So the report might say mass in the liver measures 12 millimeter compared to eight millimeter, and has increased in size. Now this would be a simple thing to say, but it would be wrong, because if you notice the one, the image on your left is a little bit blurry. If you blur something, it's gonna look bigger. So suppose I realize that, and I realize, hey, I can't measure it on that tumor and that slice. So I go to another way that this tumor is measured, and that's on your left, and I measure it there, it's now 10 millimeters. Well, I compare it to, then I realize I can't compare it to the prior exam, because that's measured on a different way this tumor is imaged. So I go to that image from the prior exam, and measure it there, and now it says, mass in the liver measures 10 millimeter, unchanged compared to 10 millimeter on a prior. But if you take those reports side by side, what you get, or a tumor measures eight millimeter, then a tumor measures 10 millimeter, so it's 25% larger, it seems that way, but I say it's unchanged. So now the patient's confused, why do the reports not match up? And sometimes the report will explain why that was done, but often it won't, it'll just give the number, give the number, the measurement for this time, give the measurement last time, and you just can't really compare the two. And to add further confusion, suppose you come back a third time, and now that, image is really blurry and I can't measure that tumor at all. So I, but something should be measured, so I find a whole new tumor to measure, and in this case, this one down here, and I measure on the two exams, and it's the same, and then I put that in my report. But now you have three different reports where the tumor go from eight to 10 to 12, which is almost 50% above the baseline, but the report still says it's unchanged, so now the patient is very confused. Why does it seem it's bigger, but, it's, but the conclusion is unchanged? And so, and that does happen, and that's pretty commonly happens, and so I encourage you to not focus so much on the numbers and focus more on the trend, that it's un, the conclusion that something is unchanged rather than focus so much on the individual numbers. And now, I talked talk about how, if there's a change, no change, no change. Now, how does a radiologist decide if there's a change in the amount of disease? And in many cases, this is done subjectively. And um, for example, here, there's clearly been an increase in the size of the tumor. The one that's circled is bigger, and then there's a second circle on the left side for a new lesion. So that's clear progression of disease. And in this case, there were two, lesions, two tumors, and then on the follow-up exam, there's just one tumor, and it's much smaller, so there's a clear response to treatment. So in most cases, it's straightforward like that, it's clearly better or clearly worse. Now sometimes it, the tumor gets maybe a little bit bigger. For instance, this one went of 55 millimeter to 61 millimeters, so that's about a 10% increase. Well, is there really a change? And so if there's a, like a tie like that, I'll use other th information to help me. For instance, if there's a, another tumor in the liver that's clearly bigger, in this case went from 66 millimeter to 82 millimeter, and I'm comfortable saying the other one's bigger too, because this one is bigger. Or if there are things, lesion tumors outside the, the liver, for instance, there's a new tumor in the bone that I'm comfortable saying, well, that one's probably bigger too. So if, in these unclear cases, these these other things can help me. And sometimes I just can't tell when I just say there's no change and there probably isn't a change. 
But um, now, Dr. Lee talked earlier about resist, and so there are ways to, to, to objectively quantify if something is bigger or not bigger. And if you're on a clinical trial, often that's what's mandated. The problem with these is for, for routine use is that they're designed for multiple, multiple centers over involving lots of patients and many, many radiologists of different skill levels, so the rules have to be, have to account for all of those factors. And so what Risa says is, for, just for an example, Risa talks about all kinds of ways to measure things, what to measure, how to measure, et cetera. I'm just going to focus on one thing, progressive disease, which is defined as a 20% increase above the minimum size of the tumor plus an absolute increase in size of five millimeter. Well, that's really a very big increase in size before something can be called progressive disease. So for instance, if you look at those two tumors that are circled, I would say most people would say the one on, on, the, on the right side of the screen is bigger than the one on the left side. But if you make the measurements, it's only 19% larger, and that would be stable disease by rhesus. So that's, it's for that for reason like that that most radiologists in a routine radiology report would not use strict criteria. For one thing, your, your oncologist might not be using resist. And secondly, I rather say something is bigger or smaller and give the measurements and provide your doctor the information to decide whether or not something is truly bigger or smaller rather than strictly say it's 19.5%, so it's not bigger, because that might not be good for your care. So this is, for instance, this is a tumor measurement form, and you get one of these if you're on a clinical trial, and we follow the same tumor over time. So it went from 89 millimeter to 92, to 97, to 101, to 107, but it's only at this point it's 20% above baseline that it can be called progressive disease. Now, if you're on a trial, that, that's fine, but your doctor might decide that, hey, I might want to catch, if there's a better treatment for you out there, I might want to catch this earlier than before you get to this point. And that's why it's better for radiologists to give the measurements and an idea of how things are going rather than be strict about, this has to be 20% before I say it's bigger. And the last thing I'll talk about is um, how far back in time should radiologists go for comparison. In most cases, it's pretty straightforward. If something is consistently better or consistently worse, and it doesn't matter which two exams you measure between. So in this case, you can compare any of the boxes in, the, in red to the box in yellow, and there's going to be a disease progression. Things are just getting bigger and bigger. And, but that becomes more complicated if you're on a clinical trial, or if your doctor uses rhesus outside of a clinical trial in which you have to document a 20% increase in size. So in this case, you have to compare to the oldest exam to get an increase to, tr to get an objective increase in size. Well, then the question is, why not always compare to the oldest exam that you have? Um, which makes sense if your tumor is consistently getting better or consistently getting worse. But in a case like this, where the tumor gets a little small, gets smaller, and then gets bigger again, and if you measure, to, if, you com if I compare to the more recent exams, I would get a true sense of what's going on, which is, well, things are not working out. This is the tumor is getting bigger. But if I only compare to the oldest available exam, then it will go from 69 to 30. I would say, hey, it's getting better, when in fact, you got better in between, and now you're getting worse again. So in that setting, um, comparing to the oldest exam doesn't, is not the right thing to do. So in practice, what I do is, I compare to the immediate prior exam. So in this case, I would say better, better, worse, and worse. And your doctor probably has, either in his mind or on paper somewhere, something charting the trend of the tumors. So in case, hey, better, better, worse, worse, just to get an idea of what's going on. And so rather than, than following the numbers, just kind of have a trend like that. Now, the one exception is, um, as Dr. Lee said, if you're on a clinical trial, the, the trial sponsors do mandate that you have, you measure the same tumors over time the same, the same way. And if, so if you're in a clinical trial, you will get that. And it'll be done separately from the report. So your report might not reflect any of that, at least at City of Hope. You get a diagnostic report 
where I might just compare to one exam or someone else, one of our other radiologists compared to one exam, but you also have a tumor measurement form somewhere in your doctor's office. It won't be, it won't be in the radiology report where one person will make all the measurements for, that, for the same set of tumors over time. And so then you get the best of both worlds. You kind of get the trend over time, a subjective um, evaluation of how things are going and also an objective response, uh, evaluation of the, how things are going. So when you're looking at the report from an MRI, I encourage you to just remember that the goals of a report are to convey to your doctor how extensive the disease is and whether or not the patient is responding to therapy. So um, I guess, again, just look at the focus on the, the conclusion, which is things are getting better or getting worse, and the numbers can be confusing. And but it's really the sense of what's going on that's important. And a famous radiologist once said, radiologists are the rulers of radiologists in trouble. Because if I look at a scan, I usually will know right away, very, very, very quickly, if something's better or worse. And numbers are just to support that. And if I have to measure things and justify something as two millimeter bigger than last time, then they probably shouldn't trust that conclusion anyway. So, um, but in cases where that is important, if you're on a clinical trial, that the measurements will be done correctly and that will be there as well. So finally, just from all I've talked about is that rate, interpreting an imaging study is not straightforward. A lot of patients think, oh, it's, why can't you just measure the same thing over? It should be it's so simple, but it's not from what you've seen. It's, a, it's I know there are numbers and it seems really, really scientific and, and objective on your report, but a lot of the behind the scenes is, is rather subjective and very variable. So, um, and I, a lot of patients will go to great lengths to find the right surgeon or the right oncologist, and they just go to the convenient place in the neighborhood for the imaging studies. And I just want to hope you understand, take from this that imaging is very subjective and it's important that you find a good radiology practice and get your imaging done there as well. In most cases, that's at the place where you're getting treated because I can tell you that if um, you know, the oncologist and the surgeon come to me and ask me to look at a study very, very often, something that I might not have read or something I read that they have a question about. But if you're having your films done elsewhere where you're not getting treated, that's not always available. And so wherever you get treated, I would encourage you to just get your imaging at that same place. Well, thank you.